so let's now see how estetrol, a native estrogen, has become an oral contraceptive method. Mr. President, you will introduce the third speaker of the day. Thank you. So um, I'm greatly honored. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Mitchell Kanyan. Um, uh, Mr. Kanyan is Kanyan Professor and Director of Family Planning in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he did his undergraduate studies and medical studies at the Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, he received an MD in 1988. He then went for training as resident at the University of California, San Francisco, became an assistant professor, and then moved to the University of Pittsburgh, um, and then in 2011 to the University of California, Davis. Uh, Dr. Cranin is a well-known expert that receives research funding from the NIH, USAID, WHO, and CDC, as well as private foundation in industry, and that has enabled him to be at the forefront of discoveries in female and male contraceptive development, including medical and safety oversight of national and international trials. He is an author of more than 300 peer review papers, review articles, book chapters, and books related to family planning and contraception, especially the most recently the sixth edition of Sparrow and Darmy's Clinical Guide to Contraception. He's also past president of the Society uh, of Family Planning. And with that, we, we really thank you very much for being with us, coming from so far away, and look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for this honor uh, to present at the Royal Academy. And uh, obviously, this is to honor Jean-Michel Fondard. Um, and I appreciate that you wanted to include me. Um, I, my, I'm a clinical researcher, so listening to all of you uh, throughout the morning has been um, a great le uh, lesson for me, as it always is, to work with uh, Jean-Michel. I learn something new every day. But my focus is more on how you take these ideas uh, and these discoveries and run clinical trials and prove what happens um, when we use these products in humans. So I'm, I was asked to review a little bit of the data on estetrol in contraceptives, which is days of data that we're going to try to break down into 20 minutes. Um, these are my disclosures that I do work with various companies. Um, I always like to say that I, I work with everyone, so I am not biased by anyone. Um, we're gonna learn today important outcomes from phase two and three clinical studies of estetrol in combined oral contraceptives. I'm gonna try to focus on what I feel are the most important areas and how the phase two studies taught us more about understanding the impact of combined oral contraceptives on hemostasis and how Professor Jean-Michel Fodar has created a lasting legacy. Um, this development program dates back uh, more than 15 years um, to um, early looks uh, at estetrol in clinical use, but more importantly, things started to move along as phase two studies uh, with uh, looking at estetrol in combination with different progestins at different doses to try to find the best combination for use in oral contraceptives. Importantly, estetrol was looked at with both levonorgestrel and drospirinone to look at bleeding patterns, ovarian inhibition, metabolic, hemostatic, uh, and other endocrine <coughs> outcomes to try to find the ideal formulation. I get asked very frequently why was this product combined with drospirinone because it worked the best when it comes to bleeding profiles and ovarian inhibition. And this is what led to the phase three program with the use of estetrol and drospirinone in two parallel large clinical trials, which I had the pleasure of working with Professor Fordar and the team at Mithra um, in uh, bringing this all to fruition. For, when we look at the phase two program, there are, the data on bleeding and ovarian inhibition, to be fair, isn't as important right now because we have phase three data. But I think the data on hemostasis has really been eye-opening and very important as someone who has been working my entire career on contraceptive development within the female contraceptive world, the goal has been how do we provide something that is either estrogen-free or contains an estrogen that doesn't increase the risk of venous thromboembolic disease. For a young, healthy woman who's using an oral contraceptive, going through a venous thromboembolic event is life-changing. Right? This is potentially very morbid or could even kill her for somebody who is an otherwise healthy user. This is the downside of combined oral contraception despite all the benefits. So how can we find something that could be safer and provide less risk? Especially where I live in the United States where you see increasing amounts of obesity and even increasing risks. 
These are the likelihood of developing a venous thromboembolic event, and we feel comfortable using estrogen-containing contraceptives, even though the risk is increased from a non-pregnant, non-combined oral contraceptive user because the risk is so high in pregnancy, and importantly, it's really highest in that postpartum period. Now, recent concepts on trying to understand combined oral contraceptives and the, both the estrogen and progestin impact over the last 20 years, I think have really fell short. We didn't have data to try to understand it. We just presumed that we always have known that the estrogen increases the risk. But the data since the ninth, early 1990s has suggested that the progestin has an impact. And I've lived through my career developing in a world where people thought that the progestin actually also could cause venous thromboembolic disease, different newer progestins actually caused this process. But we really lacked the data. We didn't understand the balance between procoagulant and anticoagulant factors and how the estrogens and progestins really affected these differently, primarily because we only had one estrogen. We always had ethanol estradiol, which is in nine, more than 99% of combined oral contraceptives. So whenever we were altering the product, it was the progestin we were altering, but kept the estrogen the same. So it was easy to try to blame the progestin when we saw different rates in clinical trials or um, in large uh, population-based studies. The regulatory agencies look at this differently on the different sides of the ocean. The Food and Drug Administration just has labeling guidance and wants all the labels to say the same thing, whereas the European Medicine Agency wants actual testing of different um, outcomes without really knowing what's important. Just says, here's the panel of tests. We want you to run these tests as part of your phase two program. Uh, but we yet have yet until recent data to truly understand perhaps which one of these or which parts of these studies might be most important. It's been really important though as we look at all of this information to understand that these tests are not necessarily validated predictive markers. We don't know which ones are most important, but we now have some more clues about what may happen as we use different estrogens and different progestins in clinical trials. And the phase two hemostasis study during the development of the estetrogosperinone contraceptive is really what gave us that first clue. This was a randomized open label study with two different comparators, an ethanol estradiol product with levonorgestrel and an ethanol estradiol product with drosperinone. So this, for the first time, gave us the ability to test a product that had the same progestin, drosperinone three milligrams daily, with two different estrogens. So we could try to differentiate what was related to the progestin and what's related to the estrogen. And these were reproductive age, healthy, non-obese women. They had uh, baseline coagulation testing and then treated uh, daily for up to six months with testing at three and six months uh, to look at changes over time. Now this is a busy slide and those of you in the back of the room are actually in the best place to look at this because this is a take the general overview look. The green bars are the ethanol estradiol drosperinone and the blue bars are estetrol drosperinone and what you can see, no matter what type of factors you look at, is that the green bars cause more of an undesired outcome than the blue bars. And the only difference here is the estrogen. Same progestin, different estrogen. So for the first time, we really can understand, is it the progestin that makes things worse or not? No, it's the progestin will modulate the effects of the estrogen. And it is really, uh, this, uh, for the first time, our ability to see these differences has shed things uh, with better light. And I want to focus on the anticoagulant proteins because I think when I look at this data, this is the most important changes we see. So you can, the ethanol estradiol levonorgestrel product is heralded by the different agents, regulatory agencies around the world as the one that they consider to have potentially the lowest clinical risk or have had the lowest clinical risk. Um, so the pink bars give you that uh, potentially lowest clinical risk product as a comparator. The, what you can see is, um, at, especially as you look at protein S, the dramatic difference when you have drosperinone being exactly the same between ethanol estradiol and estetrol on the outcomes of um, anticoagulant proteins, that it is all driven by the estrogen. When I look at this, I think that I see that drosperinone compared to levonorgestrel, drosperinone is a very neutral progestin. It doesn't have as much impact on the liver, on the kidney, uh, that's a whole other lecture. But what we're getting a chance to see is the full effect of the estrogen. And what we see here is that estetrol um, with drosperinone, you have 
minimal impact from estetrol, but you have a dramatic impact from ethanol estradiol. And drospirinone isn't inhibiting that, whereas levonorgestrel may be inhibiting the full effect of ethanol estradiol. So it's not that the progestin induces risk, but it modulates the risk of the estrogen. Another way to look at this is with activated protein C. We've known for decades that this, that um, APC resistance is a major risk factor, especially for those who carry a genetic predisposition related to APC resistance. Um, and it's a promising uh, biologic marker, but only in recently, um, again, with studies comparing estetrol and ethanol estradiol with the same progestin, we've been able to see how this works. So this is um, a, um, activated protein re C resistance um, graph that shows coagulation or thrombin production over time. So this is in a patient that um, with um, no um, activated protein C um, uh, with the plasma, so you can see the normal formation of clot. And when we um, put in um, activated protein C, you can see that this lower um, line gives you the uh, less thrombin formation, less clot formation, because you resist the clot formation. When you add a, a, uh, an ethanol estradiol containing combined oral contraceptive, whether it be with levonorgestrel or with trispirinone, even in the presence of activated protein C, you see more clot formation. So these products are inducing clot. Well, what happens when you add um, ethanol estradiol with trispirinone, there is some induction, but significantly less as compared to these other products. And notice that the highest dot dashed line here and the lower blue dashed line have the same progestin. The difference is the estrogen. So you have less impact of estetrol on clot production than you do compared to ethanol estradiol. And the progestin isn't causing this. It's all a modulation of the estrogen risk. So you can take those results from this phase two study and based on uh, predictive modeling uh, that is held up pretty well when you look at real life outcomes, you can see the different prediction of VTE risk with different estrogen progestin combinations and you can see where estetrol drospirinone will fit to potentially have the lowest risk of any combined oral contraceptive. This is all theoretical and we need phase four studies to really phase four human studies to really bear this out. So estetrol dispirinone from the phase two studies, to me the most important thing we learned is it has less pronounced hemostatic effects than an ethanol estradiol dispirinone product, that they were comparable or better to ethanol estradiol even or gestural products, um, and that the decreased hemostatic effect when you hold the progestin the same underscores the importance of the estrogen type in combined oral contraception. And as I alluded to earlier, we need large phase four studies to really confirm this. Mm -hmm. Well, what clinical data do we have to try to understand these outcomes before we have phase four studies or until we have phase four studies? Well, obviously the phase three studies, which were performed for efficacy, safety, and bleeding profiles um, were uh, really um, great studies and will give us the first view of that. So let's review a little bit of the phase three data also to look at efficacy and other outcomes. These were parallel studies done in both the US and Canada as one study, and the European Union and Russia as another study. I don't know today if it would include Russia, but uh, this is the data we have. Um, the primary objective was to evaluate the efficacy of this combined oral contraceptive, and secondary objectives were to look at safety and bleeding profiles. Now, the populations were very different. I come from a different land than you all live in. The patients I see are different than the patients you see, and the patients that enroll in clinical trials are different. So as we look at outcomes, we need to importantly understand some of these differences. There are major differences, and I'm gonna focus just on the 16 to 35 or 18 to 35 year old population, because that's the main population looked at for efficacy. The 10% of people enrolled that uh, included, uh, that were 36 to 50 are for safety and bleeding outcomes in, uh, as well, but the primary efficacy population is women up to the age of 35. And you can see dramatic differences in race, uh, you can see dramatic differences in uh, BMI, and that I live in a world where almost 25% of the study participants were obese, whereas in Europe and Russia, 5%, again, very different patient population. And the types of products they were using as they entered the study were different, where 60% of people in the European study were already using a pill. They were used to using it, they were just switching to a new pill in the study, whereas that was only about a third in the US. 
So the mix of patients entering the study is very different. And the outcomes then would be expected to be a little bit different. The pearl index or the primary measure of uh, pregnancy was 0.5 or roughly a pregnancy rate of 0.5% in the European study and 2.5% in the US trial. It's just for those of you that don't work in this world, those are both very highly effective numbers. The European study more effective primarily because of the patients that were enrolled um, and US women uh, from study after study shows we as women tend to be, uh, have less adherence uh, when they enroll in pill studies. But a pearl index of two and a half is right in the range of what would be expected uh, for a contemporary combined oral contraceptive. So the bottom line is this pill works as expected. Right? Importantly in the US trial, because there was such a high proportion of obese users, it gave us the opportunity to look at was a difference uh, did a difference exist in obese and non-obese users? And importantly, you can see the Pearl Index was the same, 2.6 and 2.9, not only statistically the same, but clinically that's the same, uh, with an overall contraceptive efficacy using life table analysis of 98%. So this is a highly effective combined oral contraceptive. It works the way we expect. What about bleeding? I have a colleague in the US who kept telling me, this is a weak estrogen. You're really just giving a progestin. It's a progestin-only contraceptive. You're going to see bleeding. This doesn't work. This is an amazing product. And again, the back of the room, you can see this best. This is the bleeding profile in both the European study and the US study. Importantly, red is bleeding and blue is spotting. What you can see really clearly is in this regimen that was given with the idea of causing cyclic bleeding is that participants experience cyclic bleeding. So it works as a really uh, good combination of estrogen and progestin. There's a good balanced effect on the endometrium. So you get bleeding when you want it. You do get some unscheduled bleeding early on as you would expect with any combined oral contraceptive. And over time, the unscheduled bleeding between uh, the scheduled bleeding episodes goes down. And importantly, what you in the back can really see well is that almost all of that is blue. Very little of it is red because the vast majority of bleeding that occurs is spotting. Spotting was defined as needing no sanitary protection, no menstrual protection, product protection. So that the majority of women who experience unscheduled bleeding experience something that they weren't even wearing protection for and that it goes down over time. This is a product that has a great bleeding profile. You can see the unscheduled bleeding rates go down over time, and the majority of the unscheduled bleeding is spotty, such that only 3% of women over an entire year discontinued because they didn't like the bleeding. And then lastly, let's look at safety. A very neutral impact on lipids, uh, cholesterol, um, as we would expect with this product, and triglycerides. And this is really important. Ethanol estradiol products almost universally increase triglycerides, which in young women is important, especially in obese young women. And we don't see that increase with an estetrol product. We see no change in glucose metabolism or in uh, long-term glucose outcomes with hemoglobin A1C staying pretty steady at about 5.3%. When we looked at adverse events that led to discontinuation, to me, that's the, always the key of safety. What kind of experiences were women having that they said, I want to stop this product because I don't like it, because it's causing a side effect I don't like? The regulatory agencies want the labels to include any outcome that is occurring at a rate of 1% or greater. For this product, there was just one, and that's bleeding irregularity. Any other complaint that led to discontinuation occurred at a rate less than 1%, which is almost unheard of with most of the combined oral contraceptives on the market. And you can see these reasons here, uh, things that people will complain of with use of a combined oral contraceptive, but at such low rates that they were not causing high rates of discontinuation. And you can see at the bottom right here, one VTE event occurred during the study, and that's important. It occurred in the European trial, not in the US trial, um, where we might have expected it since we have so much more obesity. So I want to refocus on that. We talked earlier about these risks of developing a VTE event, and we had phase two data, small phase two studies that look at coagulation parameters. We need population-based phase four studies to ensure what the real rates are. But these phase three trials with thousands and thousands of women were our first chance to look at, in some type of large population, what happens from a VTE event standpoint. So I'm going to focus on some US studies because of our obesity rate, where we're more likely to see VTE events. These are contemporarily approved combined hormonal contraceptives. You can see we have a 10 microgram ethanol estradiol uh, product with norethindrone acetate. 
an uh, ethanol diol suggesteron acetate vaginal ring in the US called Anovera, and a new transdermal patch recently approved in the United States called Twirla. Um, these phase three studies had varying rates of obesity, but you can see across the board in phase three trials in the United States, in that population, we see about three to four VTE events in every phase three trial. That's what we expect. It's um, an unfortunate outcome, but with use of ethanol estradiol products, we see three to four events, no matter the dose, even with this extremely low 10 microgram dose. Well, what did we see in our studies of estetrol? In the U.S. population with 23% obesity, we saw zero VTE events, and there was one in the European trial, not the three to four we typically see. Again, we need population-based studies to know how this truly translates, but in the first translation of the phase two data to phase three where we have thousands of women, we can see the beginning of what I call hope, that hope that we may have an estrogen that really does translate from the bench to the bedside in something that can provide lower risk for women who want to use a combined oral contraceptive. So this program, in summary, has allowed us to understand we have a product that has high efficacy, an excellent bleeding profile, excellent cycle control, good tolerability, very low rates of discontinuation for adverse events. And in my career in contraceptive development, I, this is a game changer. So thank you for allowing me to speak to you, uh, to try to make everything as brief as possible. And thank you for my friendship and the uh, continuous learning I get from Jean-Mattel Perdard, uh, who is a great inspiration to all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting presentation. And uh, I'm opening it to questions, first of all, from the room. Are there any questions? Um, I had a question, but of course, probably your patients are not eligible that would have also some myeloproliferative proliferative neoplasm for clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. Do you have any experience of people that have, by chance, a couple percent of driver mutations for hematologic cancer that are prone to this type of um, thromboembolic events, and were they, by chance, on, on therapy in the trial? No. I think you know the answer. Now, those people would be excluded from the studies, and I think the important thing is until we have more data, those type of patients really should not be using an estrogen of any kind until we know the safety. But what we're looking at is how do we, over the next few decades, drive the ability for patients who uh, may need some type of cycle control and need an estrogen to have something that could be safer. But um, you know, the point first is for and foremost is to have a product that's available for everyone, so patients like this would not be in any clinical trial or even still be recommended to use a product like this. Yeah, exactly, but in the last years, uh, there was this discovery by Ben Edward from Dana-Farber that there are people that have more than 2% clonality with mutations such as DNMT3A, mm -hmm. TEP2, and so on, and they were not known. So if they don't have any disease, they have absolutely nothing. So do you have DNA from these people in your clinical trials? No, we don't have DNA. Um, other questions? That's a great question. Yeah. Professor. I think it also speaks, though, to the fact that we know that a lot of people have underlying uh, genetic predisposition to, uh, to um, hypercoagulability, but it doesn't always translate clinically. So we still don't fully understand, just because you have a, a genetic risk, uh, the, the permeability of that risk, and it varies from individual to individual. Thank you very much for your beautiful lecture. I would like if you have the opportunity to test the smoking effect in your population. So the, the question about um, the effect of smoking. Um, there we, um, it, the effect on what happened? Hormonalism or also on uh, uh, metabolic disease, metabolic disorders of course. Right. Um, there is nothing from the trials that shows any difference in those who smoke. Uh, but to be fair, the smoking rate in the study, even for the European population, was relatively low. So low that the numbers were too small to really look at uh, large differences in the outcomes. Which I herald as a great thing because the fewer and fewer people that are smoking, the better we are as a whole. And I remember days when we could easily test this out because so many people did smoke. And it's nice that fewer and fewer people are smoking. 
In the US, they're smoking more marijuana, but they're not smoking as much as Really, really quiet Saturday for me, you know? <laughs> well, thank you for allowing me to join you. Appreciate the invitation. No, but wait, wait a second, because oh. maybe there are still questions here in the audience. I was just answering to uh, Professor Constantinescu, who was uh, asking me if I had questions on the, on the web. And apparently, no question for me. Is there any question here? No? May I ask a question? Certainly. Which is not scientific at all. It is more, ah, uh, no, priority to someone who has a, a very good question. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. That was, that was an excellent overview. And I guess one of the questions that comes up is knowing some of the benefits that we're seeing with estrochol compared to, can you hear? Yeah. Um, some of the benefits that we potentially see with estrochol compared to ethanol estradiol and translating that into to clinical practice, I guess that brings up the question of preferential prescribing. So patients who may not have an absolute contraindication according to WHO or CDC, but maybe they are at an increased risk of certain outcomes. So would this be something we would preferentially be prescribing to that population as opposed to one of the other unconscious episodes? Recognizing that to me, I, I agree, I think this is a bit of a game changer. So just wondering what your, your thoughts are. You particularly talked about patients with a higher BMI. So is that someone who we might be using this for as opposed to another one? Because that's a big question we always get, right? Which one do you choose to start and, and why? And then do we run into issues of maybe seeing outcomes, you know, adverse outcomes um, because we're preferentially prescribing? So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, the idea is do we do providers preferentially prescribe this pro or could they preferentially prescribe this product to people that are higher risk and use the ex existing ethanol estradiol products for people they perceive at lower risk? And I think that really comes in how we message uh, this new product that any ethanol-containing product in any young, healthy woman can cause a VTE event and should phase four data prove what this phase two and now phase three data strongly suggest, I would uh, make the argument that anybody is at risk that you, <coughs> that you start on ethanol estradiol. And uh, we need, I think you raised the point really that we need to be careful in our messaging not to preferentially prescribe, uh, that it doesn't matter whether the woman is thin or thick or smokes or doesn't smoke, that if she uses a combined oral contraceptive, her risk of a bad outcome can occur regardless. Um, and I think you really herald more that we need to be aware that that can happen. And I think it's important for the messaging. Thank you. Uh, may I just ask one question? It's about dosage. Uh, so uh, just for the women who are going to use uh, this uh, contraception, uh, contraceptive method, uh, I know that in the U.S. you are used, I mean, a lot of women are used to get shots. Uh, is it a possibility? And is it also a possibility maybe for uh, menopause women? Because I, I'm wondering if uh, someone who is in this phase of, his, uh, of her life wants to take a pill every, each morning, uh, or if it is easier maybe to get an injection like once a year, uh, to solve the problem, I would say. <laughs> so for the use of estrogen and hormone therapy, it's typically in a pill or in a patch. Um, estrogens, are, they're too, uh, uh, too big and don't work well in an implant or in an injection, you get too high levels to be maintained over time. Um, but uh, there is wonderful work going on with estetrol uh, for menopause therapy, for hormone therapy, as kind of was alluded to. Uh, but in uh, hormone therapy, it's really it's, inje it's uh, injection or patch. They're also or in a transdermal gel, um, like a lotion you run on once a day. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for thank you for the conference. Thank you for uh, uh, the uh, the answer.